We are now live, so that's very exciting. Welcome to Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory's Engineering Day Google Hangout 2016. Uh, this is in honor of National Engineering Week, and the city of Livermore recently declared this month uh, Engineering Science and Engineering Month, so that's very exciting. Tomorrow is National Engineering Day, so this is all very topical at the moment. Uh, my name is Marin. I'm a science communicator for the lab, and thank you guys so much for joining me. I have three of the lab's engineers here with me today. Um, we have Monica Moya, who's a research engineer in the Lab Center for Micro and Nanotechnology, and she works on 3D printing live human cells, which is very exciting. Hi, Monica. Hello. We also are joined by Vanessa, who is in the Center for Micro and Nanotechnology. Um, she, her work involves devices that can be implanted into the brain for various therapeutic and scientific reasons, which is very exciting. Hi, Vanessa. How are you? Hi. And then our last guest today is Julie Jackson, who just so happens to be a graduate of Livermore High School herself. And, <laughs> and she is an expert in 3D printing. And a lot of her expertise goes into lots of different applications, but um, particularly in the field of wearables, which you guys might be familiar with, like Apple Watches and things like that. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, why don't we start with you, Vanessa, and could you tell us a little more briefly about yourself and about what you're working on at the lab? Sure. So I've been at the lab for about five years now. I came here as a postdoc, so I got my PhD at UCLA, did my undergrad at, at Florida, University of Florida, and I've been working on biomedical devices, so brain implants for neural prostheses, so these are devices that help people see or restore other functions of the body by interfacing with the brain and the nervous system. So cool. That is awesome, Vanessa. Thank you. Um, Monica, how about you? Can you speak a little bit more about what you're doing at the lab and your background? Sure. Uh, I joined the lab almost two years ago, and I work on bioprinting. I also work on organ on a chip, so we look at um, we take the physiology outside of the body and put it out, or take the physiology outside of the body and study it on the outside. So it's a little bit different than what Vanessa does, who sticks things into brains and stuff to probe it. We take the biology out and look at it in a, in a dish on the outside. So cool. That's awesome. Thanks, Monica. Um, and then, Julie, will you introduce yourself and talk a little bit more about your work at the lab? Yeah, so um, I started the lab in 2012. Um, I had graduated from Livermore High in 2008, uh, went to Las Positas College um, for three years, transferred to Davis, uh, started the lab as a summer student, um, transitioned from a summer student to what we call a post-college appointment, and um, now I'm a staff employee working in additive manufacturing. Um, what we do is we create custom 3D printers, and we use those 3D printers to make new things, um, and also new materials that don't normally exist. I see. Awesome. Thank you, Julie. So today we're also joined by Susan from Livermore High with an AP Biology class, and then Tom. Oh, shout out! Yeah, AP Biology. They're back. They're back there. They're coming. <laughs> Tom at Granada High School uh, with a class of science and engineering students. So why don't we start with Tom's class? So we're going to go one classroom at a time and switch back and forth with questions. Why don't we start with Tom's class? What kind of questions do you have for our engineers today? Who wants to go first? Be brave. <laughs> Ask away. Okay. Um, this is more directed to Monica Moya because I know. I think you, uh, on Science and Saturday they said you had a biomedical engineering degree. Yes. Um, so I'm also looking biomedical field. Is it a growing field or is it kind of static in the terms of getting jobs out of college? You know, I think, I would say that it's definitely a growing field. Um, I've seen, I think as we're starting to become more multidisciplinary in our approach to, to science, it's definitely a advantageous degree to have because biomedical engineers are sort of jacks of all trades. Um, the curriculum is, you get a little bit of all the different engineering, so I think it's definitely 
a, a good um, degree to pursue because there is definitely very much of a, a growing field. And then, right. Sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing. It's okay. I think you answered the question, Monica. Do you guys have another question to ask? Go for it. Right. Uh, I'm going to be completely honest. I forgot the name of the person who said they worked with 3D printing. So, whoever that was. Please. That's okay. That's Julie. Oh, yeah. Uh, Julie, hi. Um, hi. So, when you're. Th the reason I came to this specifically was because my biology teacher told me about it in first grade, and she said that you were working with 3D printing things to go into the body to kill cancer cells. Uh, is there anything you can tell me related to that? Well, that might be a question better directed for Monica, because I know she's in Monica's field. Yeah, actually, 3D bioprinting? Monica? Oh, yeah, sorry, I didn't quite hear the question very well, but what was the question about 3D bioprinting? It's like, like anything you can tell me about, because that's what drew me drew me here, just my first grade teacher told me that we were working with, like, killing cancer cells by 3D printing things to go into the body. Okay, yeah, so I do uh, 3D bioprinting, um, and I use pretty similar to what Julie has in the background of hers, or if you can see the little thing that's building up, except that instead of plastic, I use cells, um, as well as the ink is a material that again, comes from the body, and the idea is that we can spatially control where we place the cells um, so that we can create uh, eventually organs, but on a smaller scale, we want to be able to create um, miniature organs so that we can test different things on them. Um, so I specifically focus on the microvasculature, so I'm trying to build up vessels, and the reason that we want to do this is because it's sort of like building a house want to make sure you have the plumbing in place before you, um, you know, create the organ around it. You want to make sure that you've got the blood vessels because that's how the body communicates with the different organs. Awesome. Do you guys have any follow-up questions? Um, I, sorry, Monica, we're kind of bombarding you. Um, so I know the biomedical field is um, a lot about studying the human and uh, the human body and kind of working against, like, you're creating, um, miniature organs to test drugs on. Is there any focus on the future and kind of enhancing the human body? I know it's kind of science fiction, but you know if there's any kind of branch of biomedical engineering that's looking into maybe beefing up the immune system or um, creating new methods of um, repairing broken bones to the point where instead of just letting the bone heal, we're actually enhancing the human uh, do you mind repeating the question one more time? Sorry, my audio doesn't seem to be working very well. Monica, it might be harder for you to hear them, so I can repeat the question to you. It was about uh, any, is there any um, research in enhancing the human body as opposed to just doing research outside the human body? Is there any sort of um, implantable or uh, extra body uh, research that's going on for enhancement of like, the immune system or healing processes and things like that. And um, maybe you can speak that and then we can let uh, Vanessa, if she has anything to say about uh, enhancement um, as well. Sure, I think that's definitely a place where bioprinting has a role, um, for sure. I know that others have been using uh, different bioprinting technologies to be able to print directly um, for example, like in the in the field when the soldiers have a wound or something, they're developing printers that help print um, skin layer directly on there. In terms of enhancing, I think that that's definitely the next phase of bioprinting, um, and I think a lot of that will uh, sort of depend on making sure that we understand the interface part of how do we integrate the biology with whatever technology we have. Um, and I think Vanessa would be a really good person to talk more about the sort of uh, technology and improvements um, and maybe even replacing functions that have been lost before. Definitely. Vanessa, do you want to speak to that um, in using uh, bioengineering and biomechanics to enhance the human body and to improve? Sure. Yeah, so in our group, we also do a lot of biomedical device or biomedical engineering, and but we are Taking, making devices that are then implanted into the brain. So, uh, for example, I have 
a device here, you probably can't see it. Whatever you're sticking in the brain, you want it to be tiny, right? So that you're not damaging the tissue. So you also have a little brain here. So we stick these devices into the brain, and there are tiny, tiny electrodes at the very tip, and they're there to record brain signals and also to send signals to the brain. So one of our first projects was a retinal prosthesis. So this is for people who've lost sight. You can stick a device that, a very similar device that sits on the retina, and it sends electrical signals, and it brings um, some vision back to people who are completely blind. So in the same way, we can also read the brain, send signals to a robotic arm, a prosthesis, and then have the person think about opening the hand of that robot, and then the robot hand opening. So if you go, so currently we're working still on restoring basic function to, to people, but if you, usually the next question on these, on comments, go online and read um, the comment portions of news stories, they always ask about enhancement and, and um, you know, what is the next stage. So for example, for the eye, we don't even need a camera to bring in vision. We can just send signals directly through an iPhone to the uh, prosthesis that's on the eye. And or you can see the kind of vision that they're seeing. Instead of visible light, maybe we want to see infrared. or Maybe you want a prosthesis that can magnify. So in those terms, you're enhancing um, normal uh, human vision. But the first step usually is we want to restore normal function before we go to the, the enhancements. For sure, in the future, there are different things we can think of where we're enhancing. That's awesome, Vanessa. Thank you so much. We're going to go to Susan's classroom now. Susan's classroom, did you guys have uh, your first question asker? Nice backdrop there, you guys. Looks good. Hi. Hi. My name is Cameron, and my question was, when implanting devices in the body, how does it not get rejected? Like, can the body not get rid of it? That's a really good question. Vanessa, do you want to start? Yeah, it's actually a huge problem. It's probably one of our biggest problems in developing specifically the neural interface. So that's that's what the art part of the device is called. Uh, it's interfacing with the brain and neurons. So it treats it as a foreign body, right? So there's a foreign body response. And that's why over time, these devices lose the ability to record signals from the brain or send signals to the brain. So there's been a lot of work trying to understand what is actually happening biologically um, when it's, it turns out we don't really know exactly what's happening in the brain when we stick these devices in. Um, either are theories, or probably gliosis, or like brain scar tissue that forms around the, the device, but that doesn't actually always happen, and in some cases it doesn't affect electro or device performance. Um, in some cases you lose uh, the ability to record because your device fails, but um, if you stick to the biology side, uh, I can say that millions and millions of dollars have been put into it. We still don't know what's happening. We need the next generation of engineers and biologists to work together to figure this problem out. But it's probably the number one problem we have in, in our technology development. Definitely. Julie or Monica, do you guys have any uh, experience in this area or any response to any questions? Um, well, it's an important one because even if we're going to be bioprinting organs uh, that eventually will go into humans, we need to be cognizant of that, that you don't want the body to reject it. So one of the ways that we can avoid that is by starting off with materials that the body already kind of recognizes and potentially using the same materials that come from your body. So for example, one of the inks that I use is um, hyperinogen and thrombin. When mixed together, they form a blood clot. And in theory, you can get these ingredients from your body and use them to create the violin. So in this case, you'll be implanting something that is from your own body, so you shouldn't reject it. Uh, but that's definitely something that we, we have to think about when we're printing uh, organs that are going to be eventually implanted into people is what are the types of materials that we use so that the body recognizes it. And another approach that we also do here when we're bioprinting is these bioheats that are going to encourage the body to self-regenerate and self-heal. Um, and that's, again, another way to sort of overcome that problem. If you just make the body fix itself, then you don't have to worry about it rejecting anything. Awesome. Julie, do you have anything to add in this area? I have zero experience in 
biology. <laughs> awesome. Good to know. Um, Tom's class, let's go back to you for one more question. Well, not one more, but one person's question from you guys. Anybody else want to go next? Okay. Um, hi, I'm oh, Sam. So oh, 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 oh. Wow. <laughs> 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 classroom, it's okay. It's 25. We're going to do Tom's first, and then we'll come right back to you, okay? You'll get to ask the question. All right, Tom's classroom, you're up. I have a question about Morgan. Like, what do you mean, like, the program? Like, um, I think you're going to have to speak up. I'm so sorry. We're having trouble hearing you. I was wondering if the organs you're talking about are going to be programmable. be programmable. Okay. I think the question is, uh, can the organs we're talking about making be programmable? Monica, can you speak to that at all? Um, yeah, I think it's a good question that sort of lies in both Vanessa and my camp. Uh, I think that for, for at least my side of things, it's more on the, the, the structure and having the cells and and that part of it, but the I think it's a it would be a good synergy between like the stuff that Vanessa is working on because she does a lot more of the um, the the electro part of it and connecting and using connecting up the uh, signals that the body normally gets and how do you integrate those with the the way that the body understands and processes those signals. So I think there is definitely I mean Vanessa spoke about being able to plant. Um, the prosthetics that the body can that you can potentially connect up with the body and bypass it, and I think that um, it's not out of the realm to assume that maybe the organs that we create can be programmed uh, or enhanced. Gotcha. Awesome. Thanks, Monica. Vanessa, do you have anything to add on to that in terms of programmable, uh, insertable devices into the body, um, maybe organs or maybe something else that you have experience with? Kind of related, there's this new area called bioelectronics, or there are different terms for it, but if you're interested, you can look it up, bioelectronics. There's a lot of interest from different um, places like DARPA and National Institutes of Health and Big Pharma. So what that is, is we're trying to use the body to get it to heal itself through electrical stimulation. So in particular, we can stimulate the vagus nerve, which is right in your neck region, and it connects your body to your organs. What they found is if they send electrical pulses, or if you stick a device, electrodes around your nerve, they send electrical pulses. Depending on what doctor you talk to, it can cure migraines, it can cure rheumatoid arthritis, it can cure a lot of other disorders that are related to your different organs. But people don't really understand what's going on. Why is it just one nerve stimulation can affect all of these different um, diseases? So there's a lot of work right now on understanding what is happening when we stimulate and then developing devices that can target the stimulation even better so that we can predict what we'll get. But the, the hope is that in the future, instead of you taking drugs that you swallow and it affects many different parts of your body or different parts of your brain that you're not even targeting, you can instead stimulate your nerve a certain way and target that very specific organ that, that's sick or get your body to spit out you know, new, new cells so that it, and watching this biology, Monica, you can, you can fix my biology terms, but so that the, the body will heal itself um, without taking pharmaceutical drugs. Gotcha. Awesome. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, we're going to go back to Susan's classroom. We're ready for <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm Josh, and uh, I was just wondering, we watched a video uh, from like five or ten years ago uh, about how scientists are allowed to use a detergent to like wash out the cells out of organs to leave just like the infrastructure left with like the mold of uh, like the protein. And I was like wondering what you guys do today in like comparison or contrast or if you guys do anything different. Monica, can you speak to that? Yeah, so I think you're maybe talking about the cellularizing organs where they just take the, the cells off and what you're left with is just sort of the, the, the scaffold of the organ. Is that, is that what you're... Okay. Yeah, so um, there are... You can also take that scaffold and smash it up and make that into an ink. 
in which case you're using the same proteins that the cells, or, or the same proteins that the organs are made up of. Um, and that would be advantageous if you're trying to print. The challenge with, uh, so the idea with decellularizing organs is you take out all of the cells and then you'll put in your cells, right? So you have like a shell of an organ and then you can recellularize it. The problem is that it takes a lot of cells to recellularize an organ. So that's kind of why it's advantageous to do an approach where the body brings in its own healing power. Um, but I think that there is uh, definitely a benefit to decellularizing and using that same scaffold or matrix to print with. Because then if you're using a material that the cells, again, uh, understand. And because you've removed any of the cellular products, uh, there won't be a reaction to, to uh, using, for example, somebody else's um, scaffold. Do you guys use like a protein scaffold or do you guys use some type of different scaffold? Is the question what kind of protein or scaffold we use? Yeah, like do you guys use a protein scaffold or do you guys like use a like different type of like substance or something? Monica said the question is do you use a protein scaffold or do you use some other kind of material as scaffolding? Yeah, we do. We um we use fibrinogen thrombin to make fibrin, but then we also use collagen, which is found in a lot of tissues. Um, we so we try to keep it to be natural body products. But the challenge with using natural scaffolds is that they have a gelation time that is on the run time. So the benefit with doing um for doing more synthetic materials, is that you have more control over the properties of the material as well as when it gels. So things like collagen gel really slowly, so it's kind of a challenge to print with those because ideally what you want when you're printing is something that is liquidy so that the cells aren't under stress. But the moment it hits the platform, you want it to become sturdy so that the cells actually are in something that's 3D as opposed to just the puddle. Um, so it's, it's a challenge with the natural matrix, but I think that there is potential for creating sort of hybrid materials where you do have some of the natural stuff that the cells recognize, but maybe you can do something to those materials that make them more um, tunable so that you can control like, the gelation property as well as the stiffness. Um, but I think that definitely being, using those materials that we have available, especially the ones that are decellularized, is, is a good approach so that we can uh, keep it as close as possible to, to nature so that we're not like reinventing the wheel, right? Like, body is really good at, at making organs and, and tissues and stuff, so um, it, it's a lot easier to start with materials that the cells are familiar with because that way you can sort of co-engineer with them as opposed to you having to start from scratch and, uh, you know, reinvent a, a material that the cells have never seen and try to optimize it so, so that they can work and understand it the way that they now normally do in the body. Totally. Awesome. Thanks, Monica. Um, we're going to go back to Tom's classroom. I see we're ready with another question. Go ahead. Yeah, so it's a question for Monica. I was hoping to talk more about the bio um, I guess bio materials, or is it animal bio materials? Um, I was just hoping you could explain a little bit more about what you're actually putting the bio print. So, yeah. question is the question about what is actually being bioprinted. No, no, uh, what, what are you using, like, what are you thinking for bioprinting to make the final product? Is it, are you using, like, stem cells, or does it vary depending on what you're making? Monica, could you hear the question? No, did you hear it? Uh, I, okay, one more time, could you hear the question really, really, really loud? Sorry, we're having some audio difficulties with Tom's classroom. What is your ink made of? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Good to know. What is the ink made out of this question, right? Yeah. Okay, so the, the ink, um, as I was saying before, is made of those different biomaterials that I talked about. So um, one, of the, one of the ones I like to print with is uh, fibrinogen and thrombin, which are the same materials that are found in the blood clot. And there are cells in there. And I'm currently using primary cells, meaning yeah. these are cells that come from living organs. Um, stem cells is definitely a different, it's, it's another type of cell source that we can use. Um, I think that IPS cells are really an interesting um, choice. Um, in case you're not familiar with IPS cells, what they are is um, cells that you reprogram to act like stem cells. So, you, for example, you take a skin cell, you can reprogram it, and it becomes um, a stem cell in the sense that it can then become any type of cell you want. So that's 
for, for the idea of bioprinting organs, that could be a really good cell source because you can imagine that we can take a skin cell of yours, um, reprogram it to be a heart cell, and then we can print um, heart cells with heart material and, you know, eventually print a heart. I mean, we're so far away from that. Um, and at the point that we're at, we're more interested in printing um, miniature organs on a chip so that we can do different types of toxicity studies. So we're focusing on primary cells because the problem with using iPS cells is that you're essentially starting over again. So your cells are very much in a immature state. So if we want to understand how drugs are going to affect adult cells, we have to start with adult cells. So I, I print with adult cells um, within different types of materials that are, you know, like collagen, uh, the fibrinogen that I talked about, the blood clot material. Um, I also, when I make my larger tubes, when I want something that has more structure, I use alginate, which is a material that comes from CV. Um, and it's actually used a lot for things, so you probably have eaten alginate before. Uh, and the good thing with using a material like that is that it is biocompatible, meaning that it's not going to have any adverse effects with the cells. Um, and it is very rigid, and it forms a gel. It, it gels under really mild conditions. So I play around with a lot of different materials, but I try to keep it more on the um, on the natural side of things. But I am actually printing the cells with the material, which is which is key because some people will talk about bioprinting, um, and what they really mean is that they're printing the scaffolds and then they're putting the cells in. Uh, whereas I'm actually printing the cells and the ink together, which is a little bit more challenging because I have to keep the cells happy at all parts of the, the print process. So, when they're sitting outside waiting to be printed, um, when they're going through the nozzle, uh, and then when they when they when they're printed, I then have to go um, and further keep, take care of them. So, for example, somebody like Julie, she gets to print something, and then she has something that she can use right away, uh, and that's great. But for bioprinting, you have the beginning of a product, and you then have to um, continue to, to to develop and have it mature to the point where you can then start doing experiments with it. Awesome. Tom's classroom, did that answer the question? Yeah, um, I also wanted to ask though, are you working mostly with animal or human cells? Human. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We're interested, like I said before, drug toxicity studies, so we want to make sure that we know how it's going to affect humans. So all of the cells I use are primary humans that come from uh, donor tissues. But we've been... Awesome. We're going to move on to a question from Google Plus that we got, actually, and it's for Julie. Julie, can you talk a little bit about your education trajectory, how you got from Livermore High School, like the kids that we're talking to today, to where you are now, and what drove your interests in the field that you're working in? Yeah, um, so I actually had no idea that I wanted to be an engineer when I was in high school. Um, I went to Livermore High. Um, I was really uh, involved in FFA, so I took a lot of agricultural science classes. Um, it wasn't until I um, was in an advising meeting with Las Vegas, and she was kind of asking what I liked. And I said, oh, I don't know. I think I'm going to do business. I like the way things work. I don't know. She's like, why don't you try engineering? Um, and so I did a intro to engineering course at Las Vegas um, and realized that this does fall in my interest. Um, so I had a lot of catching up to do. I stayed at Las Vegas for three years um, and had to take a bunch of basic chemistry courses and catch up on math. Um, but I transferred from Las Vegas to UC Davis, um, became a staff teacher, and actually um, the lab will pay for your education. Here, so now I'm doing a master's part time. So just kind of took one foot in front of the next and dove in. That's awesome, Joy. Thank you. Um, can you talk more about? Uh, what you most use your 3D printing skills for? What I use my 3D printing skills for? Um, so we work on making uh, metamaterials. So they're man-made materials that have properties based on the structure of these materials uh, and not what the materials are made out of. So I have some large-scale versions here. Um, this is one of our most interesting uh, structures. This is one unit cell, um, but the real thing is Scale down to the size of a, a human hair. Um, and what this is, is it's called a stretch dominated unit cell. And when you uh, compress it, all these struts here are in tension and compression. And that makes this um, really stiff, even though it's mostly made of air. So most materials, um, they have a relationship with their density and stiffness. 
but we've decoupled that relationship. So even though this is really light, it's still really strong. So we make new materials. Really, really cool. That's awesome. Thanks, Julie. Um, we're going to go back to Susan's classroom and take another question from you guys whenever you're ready. Hello. Okay. Um, so we were given this article talking about your uh, eye chip. Um, yes. It says it's designed to replace the animal-based testing model in favor of one that is physiologically relevant to humans. Um, and it, it does talk about this, um, uh, the tiny experimental wells you guys use for that. I was wondering if you could clarify on that process. Yeah, so we, um, so I actually also work on the exit project. I do the blood-brain barrier. So we have different organ systems that we're currently working on, um, and the idea is that we'll eventually connect them all so that, for example, I'm working on the blood-brain barrier, which is the, the sort of the gatekeeper of what will make it into your brain or not. Um, and so I'm working on the blood-brain barrier, but someone else in the group is working on the CNS, the uh, central nervous system platform. And the idea is that you can add the drug into my system, see what makes it across the blood-brain barrier, and take that and see what effects it then has on the CNS system or the PNS system, the peripheral nervous system. Um, so that's how that, that, how that, that works. So the integration part um, is, n is not something that we're, we haven't yet figured out, but at this point we're working on the different organs uh, and then putting them all together and seeing how they work. Uh, and I think we also have another one, the cardiac system. So a lot of the drugs sometimes will have adverse effects for your heart, so we want to understand, you know, if we're treating, say, a brain tumor or something, does the drug make it across? What effect does it have on the on the brain? But at the same time, will there be any contradictory effects that it'll have on your heart? Awesome. So, Thank you. Thank sure. you. Um, Tom's class, we're going to take your question next. Okay. I want to speak really loudly. Yeah. I wanted to know, um, when you're interfacing with how do you know what um, electrical signals to output do you take in before or how does it work? So what, how do we, what do we do to stimulate or what, um, what kind of electrical signal? Okay, so, so we do both, right? As I said, we record the brain signals and also we, we stimulate. The stimulation is more for therapeutic application, when it cause a change in the brain or the body. Reporting is to understand the brain or figure out how it's changing. So you, you guys are familiar with brain signals or brain waves, like um, you'll see like EKGs and devices that are stuck on the brain, and then you see the signals kind of like a wave. Those signals are many, many neurons sending, uh, coming together and creating the large uh, changes in voltage. If you go down to a single neuron, you'll see kind of the same pattern. It's of an action potential, we think in um, neuroscience or brain biology, it is a lot faster. So um, imagine many of those neurons sounding at the same time, you're going to get a wider wave. So depending on what we're trying to understand, we'll be design the device to either be able to record from one single neuron or from a whole brain region. Now, based on kind of studying these signals and how they relate to behavior and function. Um, people have started to also then try to talk to the brain, so send these electrical signals. Um, they don't, the, the patterns that we use don't quite match what we're recording. It's um, more based on charge balance. So if you're sending um, a negative charge, the idea is if it's all too, if it's too negative, you're going to damage the brain, or if it's too positive, you're going to damage the brain. So what we send are they're called biphasic pulses, so you have each pulse, each electrical pulse we send has a negative component and a positive component, so that you have a net uh, neutral charge that you're sending to the brain. You don't, you don't want to polarize the brain into one charge, so we, the, the stimulus waveform looks like a, a both a positive and negative with each pulse. And uh, then there's a frequency component, you have this, this wave that you're sending in. The crazy part is, um, so in one case, the therapy is called deep brain stimulation, and people stick electrodes deep into the brain, and the person's awake while they're getting these devices implanted. You can Google DBS implants, and uh, so you can ask them questions as they're getting the same 
drilled into their brain. We don't have pain receptors in the brain, so it doesn't actually hurt. At least when you're implanting the brain. But what they do is they send a high frequency signal to stop tremors in Parkinson's patients. So they just actually also look at their hands and see when it stops, and they know they've gotten the target. The, the crazy thing is we don't know why that frequency works or why that brain region works. So people, with, people have theories, but we don't know exactly the proper um, electrical stimulation yet. So we're playing around with that now with some of our projects where maybe if we change the pulse width or pulse amplitude, we're going to get a different response. So there's still a big question on, on exactly what signal we should be sending to cause a change in behavior or function. That's amazing. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, our next question is from Google+, Plus, and it's for everybody. It's for all three of you, and it's uh, more on career and college advice. Um, somebody's asking, what might the best college track be for someone who wants to work at the lab? Um, Vanessa, why don't we start with you? The lab is very diverse. It's a huge lab. There are over 6,000 people working here, so it um, depends on where you want to go. So if you want to go in the, the field that I'm in, so biomedical device and microfabrication, uh, engineering is a good background. So uh, the people I work with have degrees in electrical engineering. I have a degree in chemical engineering. I work with um, neuroscientists, biologists, chemists, uh, biochemists. We also have uh, people, if you're if you're trying to understand, or if you're recording these brain signals, you need to figure out what they mean. So there's actually a lot of computer science, uh, computational neuroscience that can go into this. Uh, the, the lab has is very good at high performance computing. We haven't quite married it with neuroscience yet, but I think that can happen in the future. So the, the key, I'd say, is if you choose a major, don't put that single label on yourself. Like if you're, if you decide to become a biologist, don't only expose yourself to biology. You want to ex take internships in an engineering group or do an internship in a hospital. Those are the people you're going to be working with in the future in teams anyway. But a strong uh, science and math background, I think, will get, will get you a pretty good job here at the lab. Awesome. Thanks, Vanessa. Monica, do you have anything to add on in terms of college um, career advice majoring? Um, I think Vanessa did a really good job summarizing. Um, the only other thing I would add is that in terms of what degree, like bachelor's, MS, or PhD, um, you find a variety. There are definitely quite a bit of people that have PhDs, but not everybody here has a PhD. So there's people that have master's. I mean, Julie talked about coming in as a post-college appointee, meaning she had a bachelor's degree. And I believe she's going back to school. Is that correct, Julie? To get a PhD. Masters, okay, yeah. So there's a um, there's also in addition to a diverse um, a diverse diverse group of you know engineers, biologists, chemists, physicists. There's also a diversity in the types of degrees that everyone holds. Um, some of our te technicians also hold associates degrees, and it sort of depends on what you want to do. So if you're somebody that's interested in maybe, um, leading research and uh, creating it, then PhD level or masters is the way to go. Awesome. Good advice, Monica. Thank you. Julie, do you have anything to add? Um, I agree with Monica and Vanessa. Um, all the teams that I work on are very multidisciplinary. Um, for me, I chose to get a master's, uh, primarily based on I just wanted to know more. Um, I'm not exactly sure if I'm going to go for the PhD. A lot of people I work with do have them, um, but I don't know if that's the right step for me. Um, as far as getting into the lab, um, I could recommend uh, trying to get an internship to really get your, your foot in the door while you're in school. I think that really helped me and it helped me. Um, I've even been in two different groups uh, because I started one internship and then found my way to the next. So apply for the scholarships. Awesome. Thanks, Julie. What's being printed behind you? Oh, um, so it was a fun toy. I wanted to print uh, a cowboy so it was more high, but I couldn't find one. Um, online, so uh, it needs to cool a little bit. But um, what it is, I wanted to demonstrate how 3D printing you can print um, fully assembled little toys. And what it is, I have a uh, one that I printed previously. So it's an elephant that prints laying down, <laughs> and then um, it has um, 
And so once you put it, you stack the leg. And so then you build a fully assembled little working part. So not exactly the science I do, but a good demonstration. That's awesome. What's it made out of, Julie? Uh, plastic. So we print with um, plastics called PLA and ABS in our commercial printers. So um, we have a hot nozzle that melts the plastic off the filament and um, draws it layer by layer. Uh, once it's on the bed, it hardens and uh, you can print the structure that you want. Awesome. Um, Susan's classroom, do you have another question for our engineers? Hi. So my question um, is a follow-up question to what Monica brought up earlier about blood vessels and how you're trying to like model that. So my question is, um, is there a way to uh, model like artificial plaque buildup in a small scale way for this system? <laughs> Monica, did you hear the question? Uh, I kind of cut out on the last part. Do you mind repeating the last part? Is there a way to model? Artificial plaque buildup. Oh, artificial plaque builds up. Okay. Um, there, there are people here that work on the computational side of things, and, um, and they look at, you know, what different geometries will contribute to what type of blockages. Um, and I think you probably could do that also with bioprinting, because you do have control over geometries as well. Um, and you also have the added benefit that you're using materials that, you know, actual, like, materials that the body understands. So you could, in theory, create a, a, um, an environment where you have the, the clot, and you can validate that, or not the clot, but the, the buildup, and you can then validate that against what you have in your computational model. So I think there is, uh, I haven't done that yet, but I think that it's an area that I'd like to explore, is how do we model um, computationally what we already know that certain geometries will create, you know, like EDs or certain types of flow patterns that lead to the buildup of plaque, um, and what can we do about it? You know, what kind of drug treatments can we do to see that be reduced? And we can do that computationally, but we can also do that experimentally by printing those geometries. Um, and I, I don't know how you would necessarily print a buildup, but you could probably print something that could mimic buildup. Um, I'm not entirely sure if you could guide the biology to create it on its own. It might take a while, because buildups usually do take a while. Um, you certainly can create the geometries, and you can see the different flow patterns and see if that's what your model is predicting. That'd be super cool. Awesome. Thanks, Monica. Um, Tom's classroom, I see you guys have another question ready. Remember, speak up real loud. All right. Uh, hi, my name's Justin, and my question is, what are some of the ethical problems, if any, that you've run into while doing your research, and how have you worked to overcome them? Awesome. Vanessa, do we want to start with you? So there's a whole uh, a job that called you know bioethicists who are looking at these, and all of our projects are governed by some of the work that they've um, decided are limits or boundaries to to our works. So we um, do sign forms and make sure that we're working within these limits. But um, uh, on a personal level, like or at least from the point of view that we're working on. A lot of the work we're doing is still really for therapeutic work. You know, we're not trying to control people's minds. And we're way far from that. We are trying to read their minds. We are <laughs> trying to uh, restore memory from their damage from traumatic brain injury and restore other functions. But um, uh, at this point, I think there's still a lot more therapeutic value to be had from, from this work to be concerned about us trying to control whole human beings. That's a good point. Monica, what about you? Um, so I guess we haven't run into anything just because we're more on the diagnosing side of things, so we're not putting anything into humans at this point. Um, if we were ever to create something that would go into humans, then yeah, then there's a whole lot of ethics uh, that surround that. Um, and the lab has you know, rules and regulations in place for, for that sort of work. Um, but because we don't do anything that goes into people, um, there isn't usually a concern. We do handle cells that are from human sources, and so there's a lot of um, regulation to make sure that we protect ourselves, because if you're using cells that come from humans, they may potentially carry diseases or something, we could potentially be exposed to it. So, our, so here we have um, a whole bunch of different uh, rules and um, 
they call like heart based uh, safety things that we do to make sure that we're protected as a scientist that are working. For example, like the machine you see behind me um, is a bioprinter and you see sort of a big bubble that's built around it. And we do that to protect ourselves. So when I, whenever I'm using a sample that has human or materialist human nature cells or the in that level, so that we're not supposed to uh, that, that's not really an ethics or a moral thing, but it's another uh, possible. <laughs> um, so if we were ever to create uh, bioprinted parts of humans, then that would be plus the level of regulation that we have to work with. Gotcha, Beth. Thanks, Monica. Julie, what about you? Do you have any ethical issues that you work with in your day-to-day -day job? Um, I don't have any that I've run into personally. I think um, a big controversy with uh, 3D printing in general is uh, weapons, um, which is illegal, but you can't really. So um, um, there has been guns printed and actually have fired off um, a couple rounds of bullets. So I think that's where the. Wow, interesting. Okay. Um, Tom's classroom, do you have another question or are we good to get there? I have a, a really quick question. What software program do you think you on? What was the last part of that question? Software for what? The 3D design. What, what program should students learn? Uh, if they want to learn 3D printing, what software are you using? Uh, yeah, Judge, we use it. So we use um, SolidWorks here at the lab. But I was trained on AutoCAD, um, and AutoCAD is free for students. And once you learn the basic concept of how to create three models, it tends to go over really easy. So um, AutoCAD, SolidWorks, and then um, when you put your CAD model into the software um, for the three printer, it takes care of the Gotcha. Okay, I think we have time for one or two more questions. This is classroom. Do you have another one for us? Hi. <laughs> um, so how can you be sure that your eye chip will connect to the human's nervous system and the nervous system won't see it as a uh, foreign organism? Um, so the, the eye chip is meant to be a platform on the outside, so it's never going to connect with humans. We're just recreating the human physiology outside. So that's not a chip that will ever be integrated with uh, It's meant to be that you don't have to run experiments on people. Uh, and so that, that, that won't ever interface with the with the human. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks, Monica. Does that answer your question, students classroom? Oh, we have another one. <laughs> okay, all right, we're gonna go to Tom's classroom. Tom's classroom. Hi. <laughs> We're going to start with Tom's classroom, and then we'll come back to you, Susan's classroom, okay? Yeah, no, it's okay. All right. Let's <laughs> see. <laughs> okay, so this question is for Julie. And how do you actually design the materials that are super strong? Like, how do you find that on a chemical level? Yeah, so we work with um, a lot of computer scientists, and they model this for us. So, uh, like we mentioned before, we have a very multidisciplinary team, and um, they run through a series of articles for um, whatever properties we choose. So say we want a certain stiffness and a certain coefficient of thermal expansion. Um, so we, we work with them to create these unit cells that we then tessellate in three dimensions. Um, but we can use our 3D printers to help us create those um, when they really design them. So say they want a multiply material, um, uh, material unit. So we'd have a printer that one metal in one area and then plastic. So it's it's a multidisciplinary project. Gotcha. Awesome. Thanks, Julie. Okay, see classroom. Go for it. Okay. Um. So I was wondering, for the bioengineering, would it like in the future be possible to create like superstructures and stuff like that out of the cells you're making? Which what a superstructure is, but or like like a building or like a supercomputer or something out of like the bio like bio like like bio super like or spaceships or something like that out of like cells. 
Sure, I'd like to say that the possibilities are. Is that any, like, are you guys looking into that at all? <laughs> like. <laughs> no, not at this point, and uh, that seems a, a little bit off, but uh, I can't say that you guys look into it. Okay, well, I mean, that'd be cool, so you guys should look into it. <laughs> I can jump in. Yeah, okay. um, Vanessa? You can think of it as um, some of these biohybrid things. So there's a really old movie called Existence, but anyway. You can, so you imagine like video game playing, right? So there's maybe some kind of hybrid Xbox, but that's kind of alive that you pour it into, and then it just your whole your peripheral sensory and uh, visual everything is bonded to this Xbox. So now I'm just talking sci-fi with you, but we're not doing any of this work. But I, I've seen people talk about it: this hybrid machine. Um, interfacing mostly for gaming, like all great technologies start from gaming, actually. So that's probably the first place it would go. What's okay. the What's the closest thing to that that you're working on now, Vanessa? Like, what what seems the most like that? Every everything we're doing, all, all of our all of our implants are meant to restore function. That's either. So neuropsychiatric disease, you know, brain, brain disorders, loss of vision, and loss of hearing, people who are paralyzed from the waist down, helping them to walk again by stimulating their spinal cord, restoring memory for people who can no longer recall where they live or how to drive home. And the idea is you just send some electrical signals and they'll be able to remember it. They'll be able to restore that memory. So all, all of these to me just sound really crazy. We spend it all and it's... It, it's really the true inter uh, middle between engineering and biology. Um, well, one really cool thing before we, uh, before we go is, so I mentioned mind reading. So one of the things we're doing with a neurosurgeon is we have these uh, electrodes that we're sticking on um, the patient's brain on the speech part of their brain. And the idea is you know, they say a word and then we record the brain signal with the hope that in the future we just have to read the brain signal and we'll know what they're trying to say. So for, for patients who are catatonic or locked in, they could just read their brain. Their brains are fine, but they can't communicate to the outside world. Maybe we're reading the brain signals and we have a computer speak for them. So all of that is in this realm of uh, brain-machine interface that we're working with. Oh, cool. That's awesome. Uh, Tom's classroom, do you guys have another question or should we go back to Susan's? You guys want to go to Susan's classroom? Okay. <laughs> Susan's classroom, next question. Okay. Hi. Um, okay, so we had read this article, um, but it was from 2014, and it said that you guys hadn't yet been able to develop a platform that could sustain multiple cell types. And I was wondering if you guys have been able to do that now, or the closest you can have. So we currently have... Um, Three and a half platforms. We're working on the fourth one. Um, so we have platforms. We just haven't integrated them yet, meaning they're not on one platform yet. So they're all on separate platforms. But it doesn't mean that we can't uh, use them with each other. It just means that we don't have a a integrated way on one chip where where they can connect. So we can, for example, like I was mentioning before, I can introduce a drug into my system and then collect what makes it across the barrier, so what makes it to the outside part of my blood vessel, because that's going to the, to the brain. And I can then take that uh, screen or whatever, that's just something to collect and then add that to the system. So we have not yet integrated the platforms, but we do have platforms that we can look at it and they interact with each other. Okay, all right, thank you. Awesome. Tom, are you sure? Do you guys have any questions? Tom's classroom? Last chance. All right, no worries. Any questions about college? Going to school? Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, oh, is nobody else going? Was there a question from Tom's classroom? Okay, we'll go for Susan. Susan's classroom, All right. go. 
Um, so I was just wondering um, about all this, um, yeah, all your scaffolding stuff, right, and how you're all able to, like, build tissue on it. I was just wondering how expensive all this is. Uh, yeah, it's pretty expensive. Um, yeah, it's expensive. <laughs> um, yeah, when you're dealing with a lot of things that are biology-related, there's a lot of expenses with the materials. Um, a lot of these materials don't last very long, so we can't really buy in bulk because they're expiration dates. Um, anything that is bio-related requires to spend, so there's a lot of uh, maintenance that we have to do with the cells themselves, um, when they're in the scaffolds and when they're not in the scaffolds. So it, it gets pretty expensive. This would be kind of hard to replicate in your garage, uh, just because of all the expenses. I mean, they're like living things, right? So think of how expensive you are to your parents. Like, it's the same thing, except that, you know, my cells are sort of like my little children that Then or organ donating is still probably going to be a thing for a long time then, right? Yeah, it will be for sure. Um, I think that that's the ultimate goal of bioprinting is to be able to uh, print organs, obviously. But I think that first we have to figure out the material problem, um, especially when it comes to cells, because there isn't just a bunch of cells lying around anywhere, right? They have to come, well, currently they have to come from the donor or organs. Uh, so I think that right now it's a materials issue, um, as well as logistics. Um, I think I read somewhere that it would take like a week to print um, a full-size organ just with the technology that we have now. So um, the printing technology has to improve to be able to quickly print. The cells can't be outside of the environment for too long. Um, but yeah, I think it, for a while, there we'll still have to rely on, on organ donation. But that's not to say that we can't do anything cool with bioprints beforehand. Uh, like I mentioned, making the miniature organs is going to have an impact on how we understand biology. The way that we currently understand like how we work is we stick stuff into people, or we do stuff to animals, which are not really humans, or we do a lot of like duty culture, meaning we have cells in a dish. And so by being able to create really dynamic, going to start to learn a lot about analysis. Even though organ uh, printing is still a ways off, there's still um, quite a lot of cool research to do with. All right, thank you. Thanks, Minka. Okay, Tom, are you there? Did your class have a question that we just didn't get to answer? I we got one. Okay, last question. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it, whenever you're ready. Um, how far is the brain technology from being able to, like, simulate a brain or a part of a brain? Vanessa? As quickly as you or can. Is that, is that a Monica question? Uh, it's how, how uh, close are we to being able to simulate or create a brain or a part of a brain? Is that for both of you, maybe? So. For us, we're trying to understand the brain and sticking things in it, so we're not, um, I guess we, we're trying to simulate it in the sense that when something is broken, we're trying to patch around it. We're, we've done that in some cases, like with the, with the eye or the hearing, um, but it's not, it's not fully to the point where we're getting like clear vision the way you and I see the, for the retinal prosthesis, so I think there's still Actually, uh, it could be just a couple of decades. Uh, I, it just depends how it goes or how much we want to go that far or if this is enough for us, you know, just improving the quality of life. In terms of simulation, the whole simulating the whole brain, I think that's more of a bioprinting question, Monica. Yeah, so I was thinking uh, on, the, on the side of, um, like, <laughs> it kind of depends on what you're interested in. So as engineers, we usually look for, you know, 
you try to cut expenses, right? So it depends on what you're interested in. So you don't necessarily have to recreate all of the brain to understand certain functions of the brain. So for example, we have recreated a part of the brain, which is the blood brain barrier, because we're interested in seeing how chemicals enter your brain, because the first place that they're going to enter is through those blood vessels. So we don't have to recreate the entire brain to be able to understand that. So um, as engineers, we're specific as to what we're going to recreate to understand the question. So it kind of depends if you want to, I don't know, if you're looking for brain transplantation. I don't know, maybe you do need to recreate the whole brain, or maybe you just need to recreate the signals. Uh, so it kind of depends on what you're interested in. So for us, we're interested in how stuff makes it across the brain. So we look at a very small uh, so we call them like functional pieces. So it depends on what your question is, um, what it is that you're interested in, and how much of that you have to recreate. Awesome. Okay, we're going to go to students' classroom for their last question, and then we'll wrap it up. Go for it. Okay, so can I just say that y'all are so cute? Like, y'all are adorable. <laughs> and also, so I was just wondering. How often do you guys work with people outside of the lab, including like pharmaceuticals, hospitals, other labs, like internationally, nationally? Like how often would you say that happens? Does it happen at all? That's an awesome question. Julie, why don't you go ahead and start? Yeah, um, so we have uh, a lot of collaborators from outside the lab. So. Um, a lot of universities, so um, on a weekly basis, I'll collaborate with people from UCLA, MIT, um, University of Illinois, um, and also some companies from uh, industry. So um, a big company that we work with, a uh, pretty printing company, would be uh, Fathom. So um, it happens a lot, and you can create collaborations too if you want. Monica? Oh, is that the bell, you guys? No, not at all. Okay, good. <laughs> no. Okay, Monica. <laughs> Monica, the question is about collaborations outside of the lab. Um, yes, we, we do a lot of academic collaborations. Um, for my project, for bioprinting, we are we have a couple of academic collaborations. Um, and I know that we had some industry collaborations because we wanted to get um, cells from, they had cells that came from um, donor tissue that weren't very easily available and so we partnered up with them. So there is a lot of partnering that goes on with industry academia, um, and I know Vanessa does a lot of partnering with um, surgeons because they have to be able to implant these electrodes. So a lot of times we go outside to collaborate with people, um, if there's something that they have, or something that we have uniquely, and Vanessa is going to answer this question, because there's a lot of unique capabilities uh, related to how we make the electrodes. Yeah, Vanessa, very briefly, do you want to add on to that? Yeah. Don't trust an engineer who doesn't talk to their user. Okay, if, if I'm making a brain implant, you better hope I'm talking to a brain surgeon or else I'm just making it in a bubble. So it's an absolute necessity. We work with surgeons, scientists, um, all the time. It's a requirement for, for me. Don't ever work in a bubble as an engineer. Awesome. Good advice, Vanessa. Okay. Thanks. Guys, I really want to thank everyone. Thank you, Susan's classroom. Thank you, Tom's classroom. Um, we're going to go back to thank you. Julie, our last question is for you, and it's just if you have any advice to your alma mater. And is your little 3D printing piece done? Done. I, I, so I, well, I'm going to answer that first. So I ripped off the little support material that kept it uh, adhered to the base, and then um, you can snap, hopefully not break, little legs, and this one is done now. Um, as far as advice, I would say um, branch out as far as you can because I didn't and I had to catch up. So take your science classes, take your math classes. Um, and don't be intimidated. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks, Julie. All right, you guys, have a great rest of your day, and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.